Sheila, the virtual floor is yours. Wow. I wish we had the applause right now for you. Oh, this is amazing. Chief Judge Di Fiore, Chief Judge Katzman, and all of our esteemed judiciary, President Roger Maldonado, Executive Director Brett Parker, and the superb staff who you work with, devoted members and friends of the association, personal friends and family members joining us tonight. My dear beloved community, I say good evening to you. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere greetings, warm wishes, and yes, even concern to everyone under the sound of my voice, as we are indeed in the midst of exceptionally challenging times. This COVID-19 health pandemic has radically changed all of our lives. If you're scared and are anxious, I wish you peace and courage. If you or someone whom you love is battling the virus, I wish you and them healing and a speedy recovery. And if you've lost someone during this pandemic, my heart especially goes out to you and know that I grieve with you, literally as well as figuratively. For I'll share with you. I lost a very good friend and mentor, and to honor him, I'd like to call out his name, Stephen Edwards Esquire. He was a partner in New York City at Hogan Levels for many years, and then practiced law at Quinn Emanuel. He was a big supporter of mine, and so I'm missing him tonight. My heart grieves for him. I also have to call out the name of Addie Robinson. She was my cousin through marriage, and she too lost her life to COVID-19. So my family, we still grieve for her as well. And I hope you all don't mind, but I'd very much like for all of you, even virtually, to just join me, take about 15 to 20 seconds, to have a moment of silence in honor of those who tragically lost their lives in this health pandemic. Thank you so much for that. And may they all rest in peace. I just thought it was very appropriate for us to do that at this time. And on a brighter note, I would like to take a moment to thank and salute all of the brave and compassionate medical and other frontline essential workers during this pandemic, all over the country really, but especially those right here in New York City, as we have been one of the epicenters of the pandemic. For this most unexpected but wonderful opportunity to serve, I just have to first give thanks to my creator, God, who is the source of all blessings. Thank you, God. Roger Maldonado, my dear friend, my immediate predecessor now, it's weird to me. I thank you for your kind and warm words. God bless you for your strength, wisdom, and service that you've provided to our association as you've been at its helm for the past two years. Thank you for speaking up and standing up when there have been assaults on the independence of our judges and on the rule of law, which we hold so dearly in this country and particularly in our profession. Thank you, Roger, for your promotion and support of diversity and inclusion initiatives in the field of law. And I thank you for your tireless efforts in support of equal access to justice and the notion that all persons, regardless of socioeconomic status, have a right to a justice system that works for them and not against them. I'd like to take a moment to especially thank my parents. I hope someone helped them with Zoom tonight and that they're able to see this because it's because of my parents that I am. I'm the daughter of Louis James Boston Sr. and Isabel Dolores Herndon Boston, who live in Clinton, Maryland. My father, Reverend Louis Boston, was a colonel in the U.S. Army, and when he retired, he became the pastor of First Baptist Church of Annapolis, Maryland. My mother, Isabel, worked in a hospital and she was a classical singer until she had me. Thereafter, she became a full-time mother to me and my younger brother, and I've got to give him a shout out, Louis James Boston Jr., AKA Jamie. As I often say, he's a sibling whom I must love, but I actually also like him as well. I'm proud of him. He's an attorney, he's a retired Army JAG officer, but now he works in the U.S. Patent Office. I love you, Jamie, and thank you. I would certainly like to thank all of my law firm colleagues at Arnold and Porter, K. Scholler, LLP, 
as they've been very generous and kind in their support of me undertaking this tremendous new responsibility. I wish to thank all of the members of the City Bar's nominating committee, because they're the ones who put my name forward for this office. My goodness, thank you for your confidence in me and my abilities. And last but not least of all, I wish to thank my beautiful family with whom I am sheltering in place. Here's my son, Rome Robinson. He's in law enforcement, so he actually still physically goes to work every day. Rome, I want you to know I am so proud of you. My daughter, Arielle Robinson, she just recently became a registered nurse and will begin working in the medical field next month. Arielle, I'm proud of you. And to my ride or die life partner, my husband, the Reverend Jerome Robinson, he's a retired New York State trooper who is now an ordained minister. My dear, I say thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your love, your patience, your listening ear, your pep talks, your wise counsel, and especially your prayers. I love you, and there's no way that I could do all that I do without your tremendous and unceasing support. Let me now hasten to share with you just a few thoughts and my vision for the New York City Bar Association over the next two years. First of all, everyone, if you remember nothing else tonight that I say, please know that I wish for this Bar Association to become a bar of hope. I'm gonna say it again, a bar of hope. That's the theme I'm embracing and promoting and I hope that it is, it is a charge that all of you will join me in taking seriously. Although we will certainly engage in a lot of different kinds of programming and policy formulation, I'm gonna be transparent and share with you that there are six main topics or types of projects on which I would especially like to focus during my term as president. Listing them in no particular order of significance or emphasis. Those six areas include COVID-19 recovery projects, mental health and wellness, access to justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion, criminal justice reform, and protection of the rule of law. Now, for those of us who practice law in New York City, this association, it's our professional home. We're currently abiding by Governor Cuomo's shelter-in-place order, but I do hope and believe we'll eventually be able to populate the streets and the offices of New York City again, and hopefully in the not-too-distant future. And when that happens, I'd like for the New York City Bar Association to play a prominent role in the facilitation of the successful, physical, and safe repopulation of law, fir law firms, offices, and courtrooms. And that's why I've asked the Council of the Profession, chaired by Dean Matthew Diller and Judge Elizabeth Strong, to begin researching, canvassing the profession, and collecting information to figure out ways that we may assist New York City law firms, practitioners, and courts in our road to recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm sure that the small law firm committee, which will now be chaired by Ann Wilson, will assist in that endeavor as well as other committees. I believe in the COVID-19 recovery projects. For yes, New York, we will recover. And the bar of hope will keep reminding you of that fact and assisting such that it will come to fruition. Now, I should note that as a part of that recovery project, I wish to include a special focus on law school students. Hear me, for they are, of course, the future of our profession. My heart goes out to them right now, particularly the great law school class, class excuse me, of 2020. To you, I say congratulations, everybody. You made it. Welcome to the profession. Yet, I know you're probably nervous and disappointed, Law school students have had to deal with virtual graduations, bar exam delays and complications, delayed shortened or canceled internships, summer associate positions, delayed permanent job positions, even unemployment, and other challenges I can't even fathom. But I want you to know you're not forgotten and we'll do our best to assist you with the unprecedented challenges this pandemic has wrought. We have a very strong, hardworking and enthusiastic group of attorneys who serve on the Council on the Profession and the New Lawyer Institute Committee, and also law school ambassadors, all of whom are ready to demonstrate to you, we are a bar of hope. Dovetailing with the provision of practical guidance and tips for the New York City legal community is the second project I want to share with you on my agenda. And that is my hope to further educate, garner support for, and increase 
the practice of sound mental health and wellness for lawyers, judges, law professors, and law school students. One of the most important lessons I've learned during this health crisis is the necessity of caring for your mental and emotional wellness. I was speaking with a friend of mine. She is a uh, psychiatric nurse by training. And we were discussing the ways in which this pandemic, meaning having to quarantine ourselves in our homes, having to socially distance ourselves, and having so much sickness and death in our collective lives, is wreaking havoc in our professional and personal lives and is testing the human spirit. She labeled what we've been going through as an actual trauma. And she explained to me that we are all going to have to take special care of ourselves through this and after this. And she even likened us to PTSD or post-traumatic syndrome disorder survivors. You see, those of us who work in the field of law, we are no strangers to stress whatsoever. <laughs> and no matter how much we may love the law, there's no getting around it. It's often very stressful. So now if you add an actual health pandemic on top of that, it's not unfathomable that we could become especially susceptible to feelings of anxiety, bouts of depression, and even substance abuse. And that's why I'm so thankful for the work of the City Bar's Lawyers Assistance Program led by Eileen Tra Travis. And why I'm charging our Mindfulness and Wellbeing in Law Committee chaired by Cecilia Loving and Robert Chender to ramp up its efforts in educational programming for our legal community so that we can help to make sure that all of us are more healthy, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally. And we support the ABA's recommendation that lawyers be required to take a CLE course on mental health and substance use disorders every two years. We'll be issuing our report on that topic shortly. But for now, just know that is my hope and a vision for a bar of hope. Number three, a third vision and true passion of mine is access to justice. The New York City Bar Association has always played a prominent role in this sphere and we must not only continue to do so, but because of this pandemic, we must increase our resolve and commitment to this goal. I applaud the City Bar Justice Center and its legal hotline. The City Bar's Legal Referral Service run by George Wolf, as well as the Pro Bono and Legal Services Committee, and the many New York City Bar Association individual attorneys who have tirelessly been engaging in pro bono work to assist the most vulnerable in our community. Whether it's dealing with landlord tenant issues or disparate treatment in our educational system, whether it's advocating for the compassionate release of nonviolent prisoners who have underlying medical conditions, making them more susceptible to COVID-19 or dealing with criminal justice issues related to race, income disparity, and mental Ill illness, the city bar must be involved. The pandemic is crippling the American economy, and expert researchers, they're sounding the alarm. They're warning us that the poverty rate may reach the highest levels in half a century. And quite frankly, it's hitting African Americans and children the hardest. In fact, if you haven't already done so, I'd recommend that you read the April 16th New York Times article by Jason DePaul. It's entitled, A Gloomy Prediction on How Much Poverty Could Rise. I should also note, as I am an Army brat, I care a lot about our veterans. That's another vulnerable population, as I know that they have significant access to justice struggles and issues. Access to justice. The list, quite frankly, can go on and on and on, but certainly, the New York City Bar, which has some of the finest legal minds in the country and in the world, can play a role in developing policies and strategies, as well as providing actual representation to those who are supposed to be protected by our society's safety net. But quite frankly, in these challenging times, they're merely holding on by a string. I say this often, and it is my personal mantra, to whom much is given, much is required. I believe that it's a privilege to be a lawyer. We're truly blessed to be in this profession and to have the special resources and skill sets that we have. And I believe that we lawyers have an obligation to give voice to the voiceless, serve those less fortunate than ourselves, and provide true access to justice. We're charged with making our society better, and especially for those whose voices have historically been muffled or even silenced. Noblesse oblige. It is not a mere hollow ideal or fanciful dream to me, but instead it is a true and firm standard of practice, 
I want that standard, that bar measurement, if you will, to be a high one. Y'all, I'm talking about a bar of hope this evening. Now, anyone who really knows me knows that I am passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that is indeed a fourth vision I wish to share with you this evening. It's my hope and prayer that the New York City Bar Association can continue and further elevate its pursuit to make our profession more diverse and inclusive, whether it's in law firms, corporations, or the judiciary. Come on, y'all. We New Yorkers believe that our city is the center of the universe. We're like a rainbow nation here. We have representatives from so many different races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, religions, and cultures right here in New York City. There is a wealth of untapped potential. E pluribus unum, it is a virtuous enterprise. And I plan to work closely with our diversity, equity, and inclusion office headed by Deborah Martin Owens, as well as our parent diversity committee, a committee which I led for many years, but is now chaired by Matthew Morningstar and Robert Marchman to further that cause. In that regard, Roger, I know that I'm just grabbing the baton from you, for it's one of the areas in which you worked so vigorously. So thank you. Number five, a fifth pillar of my presidency will be a continued engagement of the city bar in criminal justice reform. We see the need for such reform when we read the newspapers, when we look at what's happening on our television screens. You know, I, I don't feel like I should even insult your intelligence by belaboring the issue. We all know that in this country, we have over-incarceration. The length of time people are serving for mild infractions is disturbing. There's unfairness associated with parole violation measures, and there is an obvious and disturbing racial element to our criminal justice system that must be addressed. Period. I'm speaking truth. So again, I'm not going to belabor it or go into great detail, but I want you to know that the city bar has a criminal justice cluster of committees, as well as a mass incarceration task force. And I know that they will continue to work and advocate for fairer policies and strategies in relation to criminal justice reform. And then last but not least of all, number six, I would like to charge the City Bar Association to keep vigilantly serving as a vanguard of the rule of law. The rule of law is an imperative in a free democracy. It's vital because it ensures the supremacy of the law and that no one can claim to be above it. It enshrines the principles of fairness justice and impartiality. It makes sure that there is accountability when someone abuses or breaks the law. It protects the separation of powers we have in this country, like comedy, state versus federal, the three branches of government, executive powers versus legislative versus judicial. The rule of law protects the independence of the judiciary, our beloved judges. And through the First Amendment of the US Constitution, it safeguards the freedom of the press that which some people call a fourth branch of government. The rule of law provides for legal transparency and equity in our society. Those of us in the profession of law give oaths to uphold the US Constitution and the promulgated laws in our country. We lawyers, we're supposed to be the vanguards of the rule of law. And I pledge that the city bar will continue to be one of the associations at the forefront of that cause. So there you have it. There's a lot to do, but then there's a lot more that could be done. I know it sounds, out, sounds ambitious, and it is, but over the next two years, I do truly hope to concentrate on a recap, COVID-19 recovery projects, mental health and wellness for our profession, access to justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the profession, criminal justice reform, and serving as a vanguard for the rule of law. Okay, those are my primary areas of interest and agenda. I've only been the president of the New York City Bar for what, maybe less than 30 minutes? And yet I can hear Brett Parker, our executive director, just virtually in my ear, earnestly reminding me that I will need to ensure that we continue to increase our membership. In other words, I'd be a bad president if I didn't make an appeal for all of you who are members to help us out during this difficult time. So if you can, please pay your membership dues. We really need it. We're doing all we can to curb costs. You heard the report earlier. 
but this is a financially difficult time and we need the funds to do all of the great work you've been hearing about this evening. And if you're not already a member of the New York City Bar, we welcome you. We invite you to join us. Just go to our website, www.nycbar.org. We are currently at a, over 25,000 members strong, but hey all, there is so very much to do. Now I can still hear Brett virtually in my ear. Uh, this time he's reminding me that we need to continue providing excellent programming, especially with respect to CLEs. So if you're not already involved with the City Bar, but you want to join us in our important work, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Brett Parker. I'd love to talk to you and connect you to the project for which you have great interest and passion. And Brett, I think I can also hear you reminding me that uh, I'll need to be ready and willing to respond to the unexpected issues that will certainly come our way. Brett, I just wanted you to know that I hear you and I'm ready to take on the challenges with you. Now, as many of you know, this is a historic occasion as I assume the helm of the New York City Bar Association. And I would very much like to take a moment to acknowledge that. This year, we celebrate the association's 150th year anniversary. But tonight we're also celebrating that I am the first woman of color to serve as president of the New York City Bar Association. We've had only one other African-American president to date, and that was 30 years ago. But I'd be remiss if I didn't, with great respect, acknowledge him and call out his name. Conrad K. Harper Esquire. He was a partner at Simpson Thatcher. I hope you're watching. God bless you, sir, and thank you for all of your service. It's also my understanding that I'm the fifth female president of this august body. Before me, there was Barbara Paul Robinson. She was the first female president in 1994. And she was followed by Patricia Hines, Betsy Plevin and Deborah Raskin. They are my female predecessors. They are my sheroes. Thank you so much, ladies, for your service and for shattering that proverbial glass ceiling. Now, I wanna take a moment to be crystal clear. I am unapologetically and quite proudly African-American and female. And as this organization's first woman president, first woman of color president, I have to give a special shout out to all of the women of color attorneys, law professors, law school students, and judges of the New York City legal community. I want all of you to know that I so appreciate the support you've demonstrated to me. The phone calls, online postings, flowers, the personally written cards and letters, text messages and emails. My God, I want you to know that I see you. I appreciate you. Despite any societal and systemic challenges we may face in our practice of law and our daily lives as women of color, I want you to know you are smart, you are talented, you are beautiful, and I stand here today and begin this journey as a representative of all of you. Whether you're African, Caribbean, Latina, Asian, Polynesian, Native American, or any part of any other racial or ethnic minority, if you identify as a woman of color, this historic moment is for you. I'll do my best not to embarrass you. And I'll work hard and do my best to be a shining example of who we are and what we can do. And now, just to everybody under the sound of my voice this evening, to all beloved members and friends of the New York City Bar Association, please know I am truly humbled, excited, and pleased for this opportunity to serve as your New York City Bar Association president. I look forward to working with my esteemed executive committee members. And I have to shout out Joe Drayton, that's my brother. We, the same firm for so many years, you know I love you and, I, and I'm excited you're gonna be one of the VPs. I'm looking forward to working with Maria Salente, our Albany legislation guru, Tom Halter, chief administrative officer, Eileen Bine of membership, the Vance Center for International Justice, Alex Papachusko, the City Justice Fund led by Lynn Kelly, to the beautiful spirit, Martha Harris with respect to committee programming. And I know there are so many more, and, but those are the ones with whom I've worked the most thus far. I am relishing the opportunity to work with you and the countless other individuals whose names I didn't even have a chance to mention this evening. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I guess you can just call me an optimist, all right? To me, the glass is half full, even during this pandemic. 
when I was first told that I had been nominated for this position, I was quite nervous. That is, until I was at a dinner, it was the end of last year, with many of what we call the living former presidents of the New York City Bar Association. Let me tell you a quick story and I'll be out of your way and have your evening. You see, I was sitting at a very long table in the very stately and revered City Bar building at 42 West 44th Street. And frankly, none of the attendees looked like me. Conrad Harper wasn't there, by the way. But I was seated next to one of, if not the most senior person at the table. His name, Louis A. Krakow Sr. And I hope his family is watching right now. Louis Krakow was president of the association back in 1982 to 1984. And I guess he sensed that I was feeling a little out of place and nervous. Because at one point, he just gently and kindly placed his hand over mine he looked me directly in my eyes. And he said, Sheila, I'm excited about you becoming the next president. And I am confident that you're going to do a spectacular job. I just want you to always remember, you're not him. He was pointing to others at the table. I want you to be yourself. And I have to tell you, since that moment, I have felt more confident than ever about this journey. I'm a little choked up because unfortunately, Luke Krakow Sr. is not with us today. He uh, passed away earlier this year. God bless his soul. But to his family, please know I'm so thankful for just the little time I had with him and the beautiful words he imparted to me and his vote of confidence. Because what he said to me, I'll always carry in my heart. As a young African-American girl matriculating through the Prince George's County, Maryland public school system, born to a middle-class family, I never in a million years envisioned myself going to Ivy League institutions such as Princeton University and Columbia Law School. I never envisioned that one day I'd be a litigation partner at a firm as prominent as Arnold and Porter, K. Scholler, LLP. And then not only as a child, but even as an adult until the fall of 2019. I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would become president of this bar association. Grammy singer Alicia Keys, I love her. She describes New York City as a concrete jungle that dreams are made of. You know the song, you sing it with me. Well, I'm a witness that dreams in New York City can come true. And right now, I'm dreaming of a thriving New York City law profession. I know that just as we rebounded from 9-11, we can recover from this health pandemic, pandemic and economic crisis. We can emerge even smarter. We can be more productive. We can become more compassionate and kind. We are New Yorkers. We're resilient. Hashtag New York strong. And as I take the helm of the New York City Bar Association, I can assure you, we're dedicated to improving the administration of justice, and promoting the study of law. We are ready, willing, and able to serve. We are hashtag a bar of hope. Everyone, thank you so very much. Thank you for being here. May all of you be blessed. Please stay safe, healthy, and keep the faith. I love you. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess I'll now turn the mic back over to our wonderful executive director, none other than Mr. Brett Parker.